Would you pray with me, please, today? Lord, move among us today so that we, your people, might feel your divine power and presence with us. Touch each one of us, heart, mind, and soul. Give us words by which to live, words which will mold and shape our lives after the example of your Son, Christ, after whose example we live our lives. Amen. I'm pretty excited to get to preach on Youth Sunday because when you go home today, even if you don't hear anything in the sermon, you're going to have all those great youth songs in your head, and you're definitely going to remember the marshmallow skit. The scripture for today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and it's verses 1 through 18. I'll be reading today from the Common English Bible, but it's pretty close to the, what you have in your pews in the NRSV if you would like to follow along. Listen now for God's Word in these words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything came into being through the Word, and without the Word, nothing came into being. What came into being through the Word was life, and the life was the light for all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not extinguish the light. A man named John was sent from God. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him everyone would believe in the light. He himself was not the light, but his mission was to testify concerning the light. The true light that shines on all people was coming into the world. The light was in the world, and the world came into being through the light, but the world did not recognize the light. The light came to his own people, and his own people didn't recognize him. But those who did welcome him, those who believed in his name, he authorized to become God's children, born not from blood, nor from human desire or passion, but born from God. The Word became flesh and made his home among us. We have seen his glory, glory like that of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified about him, crying out, This is the one of whom I said, He who comes after me is greater than me, because he existed before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, as the law was given through Moses, so grace and truth came into being through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. God, the only Son, who is at the Father's side, has made God known. May God add his blessings to the reading of this Holy Scripture. So I visited the downtown farmer's market yesterday, and despite the heat, there was a good crowd there in the shade, tasting the delicious watermelon fruit drink that they had, listening to live music, and choosing from a nice selection of fresh fruits and vegetables available from local farmers. So as I was wandering the tables trying to decide what I wanted to get to have uh, to eat this coming week, I noticed several women at a table set up in the center of the market. They were cutting and arranging fruits and vegetables, forming beautiful table decorations. They made everything from a baby carriage made with a watermelon and oranges all around the corners to a whale cut from a watermelon. The creativity and ingenuity that these women showed in their creations was fabulous. That and the wide variety of freshly harvested vegetables reminded me of the creation story in Genesis. That story is hinted at in the beginning of today's scripture. It says in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now the writer uses the Greek word logos, which means word, to describe Jesus. Jesus is God, fully divine, and he existed along with God before anything else existed and had a significant part to play in the creation. In the Proverbs scripture that Hope read for us earlier, we heard that wisdom worked alongside God in the creation of the world. The early Christians, including this gospel writer, used this scripture in Proverbs to interpret Jesus' identity. The writer makes it clear that Jesus, whom he called the Word, is fully divine and existed alongside God even before the beginning of time. But in addition to being divine, the Gospel writer makes sure to tell us in no uncertain terms that Jesus was also fully human. In verse 14 he writes, 
the word became flesh and made his home among us. The Greek word here that they use for made his home among us comes from the same root as the word for tabernacle or tent. And this conjures up images of uh, Moses in the desert when God tells him to have a tabernacle built so that I may dwell among them. Instead of using a tabernacle or a tent to speak to humans now, God uses Jesus to speak to us. Jesus became flesh, so he is fully human and came to earth to live amongst us. So here, we have one of the major conundrums of Christianity that Jesus is fully human and fully divine. He's 100% divine because it says in verse 1, he is God, but he's also 100% human because it says here in verse 14, the word became flesh. One could spend several lifetimes trying to unravel this mystery. Since I only have 15 minutes here, I'm going to leave that challenge for another day. But I'll tell you, however, that I am learning to take it on faith that Jesus is fully human and fully divine and accepting that it's tied up somehow with that mystery that is Jesus Christ. The message, which is Eugene Peterson's contemporary version of the Bible, describes this incarnation, this word becoming flesh, in the following way. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. I love that imagery. In order to change the relationship between God and humans, God chose to do something radical. God didn't stay distant from us, remote and isolated. Instead, God chose to move right in the middle of our neighborhood. In Jesus, God came to know and understand the human condition. That included knowing pain and suffering, joy and loss, living and loving, and even dying. Jesus brings God fully into the world by moving in with us. When I was appointed here and began looking for a place to live in Wichita Falls, we decided we wanted to be near the church. We lived 23 miles from the last church that I served, and I found that to be limiting for me in many ways. Living so far from the church made it complicated to be a part of the community that I was serving. I didn't understand all the issues that arose there because I wasn't there every day. So when we looked for a place to live in Wichita Falls, I was hoping to find something close to the church. First places I called were the apartment buildings in downtown, and I was lucky enough to find an available apartment in Austin School Lofts, which is a renovated elementary school in downtown. We now live six blocks from the church. Now, if the temperatures weren't in the hundreds, I could easily walk to work. But living close to the church is not the only advantage to this apartment. Living in this neighborhood helps me to understand the issues and needs of this community because it has become a part of the scenery of my neighborhood. I go by faith mission every day and see the people standing outside, many of them hoping for some kind of work for the day. I see the large sign on one of the neighborhood houses announcing in no uncertain terms that they are not drug dealers. I see a house with a dozen cats of all sizes on the porch. I see an adoption facility just across the street from the church. I see the office for Meals on Wheels. And every day I appreciate the fact that this church has chosen to remain here even though downtown has changed drastically since this church was started over 130 years ago. This Christian community has chosen to stay where you were planted and work to help the people in this neighborhood rather than running from it. And I applaud you for that. Jesus is fully human and fully divine, and he moved into our neighborhood. But I believe the most important point of this gospel in John is found in the 18th verse. It says, No one has ever seen God. God, the only Son, who is at the Father's side, has made God known. No one has ever seen God. Even the famous people in the Hebrew Scriptures didn't see God. Moses saw the burning bush. He talked to God, but even Moses never saw God's face. Jesus, on the other hand, the Scripture says, is at God's side. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, says, Jesus was at the bosom of God, the highest unity 
and the most intimate knowledge. The relationship between God and Jesus is the deepest intimacy possible. Who better than to reveal God to us than Jesus? Jesus has taken this unreachable, unknowable God directly to the people. The relationship between God and Jesus allows him to do that. The purpose of his entire ministry is to make God known to us. The Message Bible for this scripture says, No one has ever seen God, not so much as a glimpse. This one-of-a-kind God expression who exists at the very heart of the Father has made him plain as day. Because of Jesus, God need never be a stranger to us again. Now, when I was a teenager, one of my favorite bands was the Beatles. I listened to their records all the time, um, read about them in magazines. I knew their favorite food, their favorite places to visit. Um, if they had had a concert when I was growing up in Jackson, Mississippi, I would have been there on the front row cheering them on. I would have given almost anything to go to a concert of theirs, much less to have an opportunity to speak to them one-on-one. -on -one. Now, knowing how crazy I was about the Beatles, imagine with me, if you will, that I discover one of my neighbors is a childhood friend of Paul McCartney. The next thing I know, I'm over at their house, and Paul and the rest of the band come by to visit. And before I know it, I'm sitting down to dinner and having a long conversation with Paul and George and John and Ringo. Suddenly, my connection with my neighbor who I've known all my life, has made my wildest dreams a reality. How amazing would that be to have someone, that sort of connection, that I, to someone that I really wanted to meet and get to know? Now, this kind of access is exactly what Jesus offers us, except on a much grander scale. Jesus and God are bosom buddies, childhood friends, you might say. Jesus gives me the opportunity to sit down to dinner with God, to really get to know God, to be a child of God. But what do I have to do for this opportunity? It's going to cost me a lot of money. Are there a whole list of things that I have to do or rules that I have to follow? No, there's no strings attached. I only have to welcome Jesus, be a neighbor to him, and believe in him and what he stands for. At Jesus' house, in my neighborhood, I can meet God. I can come to know God as a parent. All people are children of God, as Claire read to us in Ephesians, but Jesus offers us the opportunity to form a deep, intimate relationship with God in a real parent-child way. Jesus gives us the power to become who God longs for us to be, our true selves. This is the amazing thing this gospel writer wants to share with us. Jesus Christ, fully God and fully human, moves into our neighborhood and invites us over to break bread with his best friend, God. After meeting us, despite all of our shortcomings, God wants to adopt us. But the question we have to ask ourselves is this. What difference does it make? Once we realize that our neighbor Jesus can introduce us to God, give us backstage passes to hang out with the Almighty, what are we going to do about it? Do we welcome Jesus into our neighborhood, into our house, into our life? Do we commit ourselves to a relationship with Jesus, with God, with the Holy Spirit? Do we become true children of God, knowing that it means a commitment to be good neighbors to all people because they're all children of God also. The incarnation, my friends, changed the world. Jesus invites us to enter eternal life, the very life of God. Many people in Jesus' time rejected him and his message. Many of us today are still rejecting him. Are we in our self-absorption closed to the light of God's truth brought to us by Jesus? If we accept Jesus for who he is, take seriously the opportunity to be true children of God, then our lives will be different. Our motives will change when we truly welcome Jesus into our neighborhood. So I ask you once again, Jesus, 
fully divine and fully human moved into your neighborhood so that you might really know God. What difference will that make in your life? Amen.